It's about piano virtuosos in uh, America and their touring. <clears throat> and then, of course, he's writing this book on the Brahms Requiem, which should be out next year, we will, we will hope. Um, he has written numerous articles. Uh, he has contributed to the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians. Those of you in my classes, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, you should be aware of that. And uh, we are very excited to have you here, and thank you very much. Let's give him a hand. Well, thank you for coming out today. Uh, I'm going to talk, as Jason said, about the Brahms Requiem. Uh, I do want to use it sort of as an example, though, of how to really study anything, and how to, uh, to be a critical thinker and a critical reader. And that's what, uh, you know, hopefully you're becoming while you're here at seminary, especially if you're a college student. I mean, our curriculum is really designed to make you a critical thinker as you read uh, the great minds of history and you realize, well, he might have been smart, but I don't agree with him because he has a different worldview than I do. He does not have a biblical worldview. So I think that's even more critical today than ever when there's fake news everywhere. You don't know what to believe and everyone is putting a spin on it and you know they're putting a spin on it. So you can listen to it from this angle and you can listen to it from that angle and you realize it's probably somewhere in the middle, but we can't always get to that. We don't have access to the facts. Now frequently, you know, if you're reading something theological, you probably are aware that there are thousands of writers that have written about the Bible and they're all reading the same book, but they come up with different opinions about it. So there you've probably been trained to be critical, but maybe you're, you're reading something about music and you think, well, I don't know anything about Brahms, I don't know anything about the Brahms Requiem, I just need to believe what the people tell me. This author teaches at Harvard, and this book has been published by Oxford University Press. Our library bought the book. You can buy it on Amazon. I can have it tomorrow. It must be true. You know, but you, you don't have to believe everything you read. You shouldn't believe everything you read. And though you may not have access to all the documents they looked at, you can at least decide, are they making you know, a logical conclusion based on the evidence they have given. Have they provided real evidence? A lot of the authors I've looked at on Brahms, I feel like there's no evidence there. They're just giving me their opinion, but they are making it sound like fact. And most students think, I just, they know more than I do. I just need to believe them. I'm going to quote this in my paper. And this is how I really got onto this topic. Um, I would have students writing on this piece, and I had, I first heard it 40 years ago, this, in the, this, in the fall of 77, I remember the first time I heard it, it was a beautiful piece, and I didn't really start thinking about it too carefully until I started teaching here over 30 years ago, uh, and I have taught it probably every year, or at least every other year, and I've read a little bit about it at the beginning, and I thought, well, this is biblical text. I can, I understand this piece. I don't need to constantly be reading about it. But my students would write papers, and they would quote some of these authors and say, oh, this is not really about Jesus, and it's not about uh, Christianity. It's meant to be, you know, a work that's universal for everyone in the world. And students would quote this, and I would write, snarky comments saying, uh, can't you read the Bible yourself? Uh, aren't you a seminary student? Shouldn't you know better? Can, do you really believe this? You know, you're entitled to have your own opinion. So as I would read these papers, I really would get sort of agitated. <laughs> How can these people say these things and get away with it? And I thought someone needs to set them straight. And so finally I decided, well, maybe it should be me. And I first started, I gave a paper at a small conference that was very subjective, and it was to specifically, it was a Christian scholarship in music. So I was sort of speaking to the insider group. It was very subjective, and I thought, I don't think they really thought very much of that. So I thought, I need to really dig down and do some real scholarship. So I've really been working on this topic for quite some time, very seriously for the last six years. Three years ago, I had a very hefty article, and I thought, this is it. This is all I need want to say. It was longer than anyone could possibly have published in a journal, but I was 
in denial. Uh, then several friends said, this really needs to be a book. And I said, I don't want to write a book. I am done. There's nothing else to say. If I turn it into a book, it's going to be sort of padded. I didn't want to bring in extraneous material. And I didn't want to read any more German, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but then my, my best fr musicological friends convinced me it needed to be a book. And I was so just crestfallen. But then the next morning I woke up and I thought, I have a book, you know, <laughs> which I had no idea. And of course, three years later, you know, I almost have a book. And now I'm worried that it might be a little too long because there's so much out there. Uh, so I just want to talk to you uh, some of my findings, but also my approach to it and how I'm trying to explain through documentation and through logical argument how my interpretation of this piece is at least a valid one. I think it's obviously the best one, but if I can at least people get people to stop saying it's not about Jesus, you know, I will be happy. Uh, so the first couple of pages of your handout uh, are some excerpts from these recent writings uh, on the Requiem. And this is what has gotten me uh, the impetus for my research. So first of all, uh, I know a lot of you are musicians here, but not everyone. So Johannes Brahms was a German composer of the 19th century. Uh, he was a good German Lutheran, and we'll talk more about that. In you know, the typical Requiem, if you know the Mozart Requiem or the Verdi Requiem, it's a setting of the Latin Mass for the Dead. It's a, the, the, the liturgy for the Catholic Church includes traditional parts of the Requiem, the Kyrie, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei, but there are also additional texts that are prayers for the dead. Of course, the Catholic Church believes basically everyone goes through purgatory to get to heaven. It's a time of purification. And so they believe, you know, you can pray the dead to help them get out of purgatory a little bit sooner. Of course, now we're talking millions of years, which seems like a long time, but I guess in, compared to eternity, not all that long. And of course, this is one of the things that helps start the Reformation is that Luther was opposed to selling indulgences, which was to get people out of purgatory sooner. And basically he said, if the Pope has the power to get people out of purgatory, why doesn't he just do it because he's a good guy? You know, why do we have to pay for it? Why do the rich get out quicker? And I still don't know, it's like, why, how does this piece of paper go with you to purgatory? How does it not, like, burn up at some point? And, you know, like, I had a piece of paper to get me up. Uh, so Luther was very opposed to praying for the dead. He says the Bible tells us to do nothing for the dead. We're supposed to take care of the people who are still alive, take care of the needy. So uh, the Lutherans never really developed a standard liturgical text for a funeral service like the Catholic Church did. So you have lots of, uh, every piece is sort of unique. Frequently they set biblical text. If you know any Bach cantatas, some of them were funeral cantatas and they include scripture, a lot of uh, excerpts from chorales, maybe some newly written texts that were set as arias. So Brahms, as a good Lutheran, chooses his own text, and it's all from the Bible. And that's why uh, I think it is about Jesus, because Luther basically said all the Bible, you know, the name of Jesus rings throughout the Bible. So anyway, I've highlighted some of the excerpts here. Anything that's emphasized sort of mentions it's not about Jesus, it's not a nominational, it's universal. They also talk about... Uh, we know this is what Brahms intended, and that's an extremely important point. So on the third page, uh, my whole first chapter is just, here's the foundation for my reading of this piece. And so I've just tried to make it extremely scholarly, and it's, you know, it's not just my opinion as someone who loves Jesus, it's about the, the rec room is about Jesus. I had to have someone else support me. So one thing I did was to read a lot of literary theory. And in general, I would encourage you, you know, as you're looking for something to do research on or to write about, you know, find something that not only interests you, but you feel like 
you have some specialty that will help you um, bring something uh, new to this piece. And in some ways, I feel like, of course, I'm at a different stage than most of you in my life, my career, but it's like everything I have experienced has helped me understand this piece in a certain way. And it's my love of Brahms is just as a composer uh, from a high school student through college, my academic study, my teaching here, sacred choral music for over 30 years, access to a theological library and free copies, you know, that's, that's been very helpful. Uh, you know, some, even some of my personal experiences with uh, loss, as some of you know, that's helped me to really appreciate this piece. The one thing that I had to stretch myself on uh, here was this interest in literary theory. It's not really something I care that much about previously, and a lot of it's very dense. And they get so obsessed about very minute details, and it's very philosophical. And I was reading through all this material, and I finally decided I wasn't going to understand at all. I just needed to keep reading until I did understand something. Uh, I didn't want to spend 10 or 20 pages explaining some arcane theory that didn't really mean anything. So I did find a number of things uh, that have helped me support my reading. And one is like, the title uh, means something. It's like, really? Oh, well, I'm glad someone could say that because, I mean, that's sort of a given. But there are people that say the, the title means something. The subtitle means something. The first words are especially important. The last words are especially important. So we'll keep that in mind as we look at those. Uh, but one interesting idea is this, what's been called the intentional fa fallacy. And you'll see some of the writers talking about what was Brahms' intention to do this. So one big question is, does it matter what the author's intention is, whether it's a poem or a book or a film or a piece of music? And some people would say it really is irrelevant. What we really need to look at is what do they actually create and what does that tell us itself? And I would say you can have good intentions, but maybe they were, you did not follow through on those. You know, you might have had intentions to make 100 on that exam, but maybe, you know, you made a 63, you know. So does the, the professor give you 100 because you had good intentions? No, he gives you a 63. So what we need to look at is what Brahms actually created, not what he intended. Of course, with Brahms, we don't know what he intended. He never tells us. He never... He was very cryptic about his music, very rarely spoke about it, and certainly not in any philosophical term, uh, terms at all. So I have a quote there that uh, the designer intention of the author is neither available nor desirable. Uh, so I think that's one place where scholars go wrong. They're too obsessed with Brahms' intention. The other area is what Brahms actually believed. Now we know he was raised as a Lutheran. He was very proud that he went through confirmation. And uh, he, we know he read the Bible. He was very proud of his biblical knowledge. He said he could find his Bible in the dark. And he lived most of his life in Vienna that was very Catholic, but he grew up in North Germany. He says people don't understand how North Germans love the Bible. And we know that he learned it in school, and he was godfather to about 16 different children of his friends, and which shows that they at least continued in certain kinds of church practice. Now, I think the fact that Brahms lived in a totally different city than his godchildren might suggest it was more than, more than honor than a real service. But there's... Uh, one letter he writes to a friend, he's, he's been asked to be the godfather, the child, and he says, I'm not, I don't think I'm really worthy to be a godfather, but uh, I am not uneducated in what concerns baptism and can give you some good advice. And he says, for instance, you can use warm water or cold water. He says, Luther says, water is water. And he says, you, you can also use beer or milk if you have to. <laughs> uh, and so he's always a little bit funny when he quotes the Bible. Um, and that information he got from Luther's table talk, which we know he owned that. That's, you know, a collection of sayings that Luther told to his students and friends and they would write down his conversations. 
Uh, and there are a number of other places where he's uh, referencing scripture and he's apologizing to a friend. And he says, you know, we have all fallen short and come, fallen short of the glory of God. Um, and that sounds like a Baptist more than uh, a, you know, an atheist. Now, a lot of, I don't think he was you know, the believer we would want him to be. I think a lot of the negative comments about his faith come from friends who want to remake Brahms in their image. So I'm very cautious of what someone else said about Brahms said. Uh, supposedly he didn't believe in immortality, uh, but you would never guess that from the, the verses he chooses. So again, we need to look at the piece itself, not what he actually believed, and we, don't, we can't really narrow that down. Uh, I found a really good quotation from uh, this famous critic, Edward, Edward Hanslick, who was really the most famous critic, music critic of the 19th century. Lived in Vienna, was a very good friend of Brahms. They spent a lot of time together. And he says, aesthetic criticism is no inquisition. So he's writing a review of a piece by Liszt. It was a mass. He thought it was a terrible piece. He didn't like Liszt's music in general. He didn't think it was very sacred. It was too dramatic and too chromatic. Uh, but he says, you know, I don't doubt the, the piety of the composer, but the piece itself is not very good. So he says, you know, I don't care how much you believe, you might not be a very good composer. And that's something, you know, we could use that today when we're looking at current church music. You know, I know you believe, but this really is not a very good song. Uh, then he also says, it's vice versa, you know, someone could not believe and still write a great piece of music to biblical text. And I think that's what Brahms has done. Uh, so sola scriptura, hopefully that's a phrase you know uh, these days, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. That was one of uh, Luther's phrases that, you know, it's only what the Bible says. It's not what church tradition says. And for me, as you know, Brahms chose only biblical verses, only verses from the Bible. He could have chosen anything he wanted. He was making this up himself. He could have chosen verses from other sacred texts. If he wanted really for it to be universal, you know, throw in a little bit of the Quran or some other text, and then we would have to really figure out what it meant, and I probably wouldn't be interested in what that meant. But it's all scripture, and I think then we should uh, interpret it in the way that this is biblical text and it's okay to bring our biblical knowledge to it. Another sort of literary, literary theory idea is this uh, concept of intertextuality. And basically as someone writes uh, a novel or a book and they, they might make references to other, to other books. You know, you might say, oh, comps, it's going to be my Goliath, you know, or it's going to be my Red Sea moment. Well, those are references to Old Testament stories, and the writer is going to assume that you know those and that you're going to bring your understanding of that. So that's a use of intertextuality, anytime that you refer to some other text. So the Bible is one of the great sources that have been used throughout Western literature in the last several hundred years. Shakespeare is sort of the other big source that if you don't know what to be or not to be refers to, then you're going to miss out on a lot of quotations. And that, you know, the author expects you to bring your previous experience to it, and you can't help but bring that experience to it. And you might bring some other experience that the author didn't have, and you may read some other things into it. But for me, if you're quoting nothing but the Bible, then it's obvious we're going to bring our biblical knowledge to the understanding of those texts. And I would say a lot of these texts really wouldn't make sense just by themselves unless you knew the context of that. You would have to make up your own context like, who is this Lord? You know, well, we know who it is, but if you haven't read the Bible, you might not know. But uh, that is just how readers work. And they don't necessarily think, oh, I will now consult the intertext to understand what he means by Goliath. Like, oh, we just know that was a giant, and it's both a literal image and a figurative image. <laughs>
Now, while the authors really want you to approach this piece sort of as hermetically sealed, like you're not supposed to consult anything else, you're not supposed to know what this text means, because they always say, oh, it's not about Jesus because he never actually uses the word Jesus. But there are lots of references to Lord and things, and we'll look at those. But so I looked at some of his other choral works. You know, did he want people to know the context of those works? And I'll give you two examples here. So Ronaldo was just a selection from a poem, and he had, you know, on the program and in the score, there's uh, some excerpts that precede what he set so people would know the context of it. Uh, the second piece there, Nene, uh, it's a piece about death, and it references these three uh, uh, Greek mythology stories about Orpheus, Adonis, and Achilles, but it does not mention their names. So he has the text printed, and then he has footnotes so that you understand all these references. And, you know, there are more footnotes than the actual text. So you know it's a really good, it's a good dissertation if your footnotes are longer <laughs> than your actual text. So... And there are other examples, but he wanted to, people to understand what the piece was about. And there are other settings of biblical texts that people went to great lengths to, to explain to people. And sometimes they would complain about, well, this piece sort of starts in the middle. We don't really know what it's about. Uh, so everyone then and today assumes you need to know the context and they go to great trouble to explain it, but when it comes to the Requiem, it's like, no, you're not allowed. It's like, I'm sorry. Uh, that's what it's all about. Biblical literacy, this is something I just uh, did some research on this fall. I'd had a few anecdotes where uh, Brahms talks about he learned uh, scripture in public school growing up. And he said, you know, we all learned it. It was sort of drummed into us. We didn't necessarily understand it or appreciate it, but it was there. Um, and then there are other quotations about, uh, you know, Brahms writes uh, a piece in celebration of the victory of the Franco-Prussian War, and he sets text from Revelation. And a critic says, you know, a German composer knows if he really wants to touch the German spirit, he needs to draw from the Bible, not from our national myths and legends, but it's the Bible that resonates with us. But I did some study on you know, public school instruction. The German schools were the best schools uh, in the world at the time. Lots of people came to study them. It was, I think, at least six years of mandatory public schools, like from 8 to 14. And religious instruction was a key part of the curriculum. They learned not just the stories, they learned Luther's catechism, which is all about the doctrine. They memorized hundreds of verses. They learned at least 50 chorales or hymns. And they had better biblical training than probably any other time in history, unless maybe you went to a private Christian school today. So the German public knew these verses. They knew the biblical context. Uh, and one thing that's really ticked me off by these recent authors is they try to make it sound like everyone then understood it as a universal piece, as a non-Christian piece. And that is just, that is a lie. That is a scholarly malpractice, and I am going to sue. <laughs> so uh, I will share the profits with you because <laughs> I'm sure there will be none. Um, so the subtitle and textual choices, this is where, you know, some of this literary theory comes in, like, oh, yeah, the title means something. So um, I think I didn't explain the title. So it's, he called it a German Requiem to differentiate it from the Catholic Requiem. And, of course, it is in German, and that's uh, the text of the, of the Bible that he read in, and he was writing it really for Germans, he wasn't writing it for people in other parts of the world. I'm sorry, only a middle-class German audience who appreciated classical music, who had the time and the money to go to a concert to hear an orchestra that was well-trained and a choir that was very skillful, that's the only place this piece could happen. 
it's not going to happen in Mecca or somewhere else. I'm sorry, Anchors. The fact that you're using an orchestra, the fact that the choir is not just chanting on a single pitch, uh, that rules out a lot of religions right there. Uh, so the, uh, the subtitle, though, he says, After Words of Holy Scripture. So he's telling the listener this is all from the Bible, and he's very proud of that. Now, the next page, or a couple of pages later, I list a number of pieces that use that subtitle. That was actually very common. And uh, Messiah was published in German with that subtitle. That wasn't Handel's subtitle, but they added that. But they always, if it was a musical piece, an oratorio, something, they would always you know, give the composer's name, and then they would say the poetry by so-and-so. And if it was from the Bible, they would have this phrase. So it's, it's not a mystery where this comes from. He, he advertised it to us. And the verses he chooses, a lot of them are, are, are very well-known pieces, and I've tried to establish, you know, how many composers set these texts before, and so I give you a couple of samples there. Some texts set more than 80 times just by German composers in German, so I didn't even look at Latin or English or any other language. And of course, as musicians, we tend to think, oh, yeah, this, this text is famous because Brahms set it to music. It's like, no, it's famous. It's, it was famous first, then Brahms set it to music. Okay. And um, there's one Baroque writer says, you know, when you're choosing a text, you know, choose one that the con con congregation already knows or perhaps even knows it by heart so that they can relate to it. Don't just choose obscure things. So almost all of his texts were well known. Um, so I have like over 350 uh, examples of this, and that's not even including, uh, and 75 anonymous settings. So that's a lot. And I, I'm not saying that he knew those, but these were very popular pieces. Then the very last one there on page three, but the word of the Lord endures into eternity. So he quotes that, and this has nothing to do with, you know, mourning or grief or even an afterlife, really. Uh, and it's sort of the end of a, another quotation that is about death. But he didn't have to quote this, and this was actually sort of the rallying cry of the Reformation. Now, this was sort of Luther's phrase, and you know, it was still very popular among Lutherans. Uh, but he's really calling attention to the Bible and that it endures into eternity. So we should take this seriously. And he's not, you know, trying to hide this or obscure it. And I certainly, that was the first verse I would leave out if I was trying to make it, you know, more universal. Uh, page four, this is just, uh, so you'll see an original edition of the score that has the subtitle there. They did abbreviate holy, but that's okay. Germans like to abbreviate. But notice where this score is housed. It's in the Bold Music Library. Good for us. We have an original edition of the Brahms Requiem. Page five just lists some of the pieces that have that same subtitle as Brahms, and I'm sure he would have known some of these pieces. It includes Mendelssohn's St. Paul, the Lobkazong, the Song of Praise, Elijah. Uh, so he's following a tradition, and We'll see over and over again, he follows a lot of tradition, both biblically and musically. Uh, page six just has a list of the verses that he chooses and how they're organized. Uh, so he begins with a New Testament text, and that, I think, sets the mood right there that, uh, you know, don't quote from the New Testament if you're trying to avoid talking about Jesus. And, of course, this is from the Sermon on the Mount. It, he opens with Jesus' words. And you notice towards the end, it's the last two movements are strictly New Testament. Of course, he's really talking about heaven here, so he really needed to use the New Testament for that. So even though they're somewhat uh, evenly balanced between Old and New Testament, I think the fact that he begins with New and definitely ends with the emphasis on the New Testament, uh, skews it in that direction. Now, a lot of people also talk about, well, he doesn't say anything about, you know, the crucifixion. So, therefore, it, you know, it's really incomplete and that he was avoiding that. 
and I say you can't include everything in every piece. Not every sermon can cram everything into it, even though sometimes you think people are trying. <laughs> and it's like, I think, you know, you've said enough. Um, not every piece of music needs to have every bit of doctrine in it. That's just understood. Uh, he only has 25 verses. You know, he's not going to include everything. And it's, uh, he's choosing things that are, relate to mourning and comfort. He's not trying to write a systematic theology here. Uh, and the great example I use is the St. Matthew Passion which by Bach, which a lot of people say that's the greatest piece ever written about the crucifixion. But you know what? You perform it on Good Friday, and when it's over, Jesus is he's, he's dead. He's in the tomb. And you have to come back Sunday to find out what happens to him. So we don't say the St. Matthew Passion is not really a Christian work because it leaves Jesus in the tomb. It's just this is one section that we're... Um, uh, focusing on. Uh, the one thing I do uh, definitely disagree with them on is that they sort of leave out some, they don't deal with every word, every name, every proper name in the text. And so I have a quotation here. You know, your interpretation needs to um, have an understanding of everything in the text. If you're leaving something out, then it's probably not a very good interpretation. Um, so uh, that's sort of my foundation for my uh, interpretation. Then on page seven, uh, and then I, I go through sort of a biblical exegesis. I don't know. I'm sure people in theology school wouldn't really think it was an exegesis, but. Um, so everything up to now has really been to say it is okay, it is permissible to bring your understanding of the entire Bible to this text to understand what it means. So one author said there's a Christological deficit here because he never says Jesus or Christ. Now he never like omits it from a phrase that he's chosen and he's very, he's very uh, faithful to the text. He's not really, you know, taking a phrase here and a phrase there. And, or it, it, in no way does he ever change the meaning of it. But, you know, I say there's a Christological abundance. The opening words are from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So these are some of the most famous words that Jesus ever spoke, the, the Beatitudes. And I know the people would have recognized that immediately. So immediately we go, okay, this, this is a requiem from Scripture, the first words, Jesus speaking. Okay, I think maybe this is about Jesus. I'm not sure, but let's, this is my first guess is about Jesus. Uh, and as I've said, someone has written that, you know, the opening line really sort of sums up, frequently sums up the whole book, if you know famous uh, novels frequently have an opening line that people know that first line whether they've you know read the book or not it was the best of times the worst of times you know I haven't read that book uh, but Tale of Two Cities you know uh, then movement five another quotation from Jesus uh, this is at uh, the Last Supper part of the farewell discourse, several chapters in John of lots of encouraging words. It says, you have now sorrow, I'll see you again. And of course, he's referring to his crucifixion and resurrection. So there are two statements from Jesus. And actually, this fifth movement was added after someone complained, like, couldn't you add something else that would make it more uh, specifically Christian? And he didn't add what that person wanted, but he did add this movement. So more words of Jesus, I don't think that's going to uh, take us in a different direction. Then the second movement has a reference to the coming of the Lord. So we all understand that would be the second coming of Jesus. Now, Lord is used a number of times here. And, of course, we want to know who does that mean. And the only way to know that is to bring our knowledge of the biblical context. And then the very last movement, again, the last words tend to sum up, you know, an entire work. And blessed are those of the dead who die in the Lord. 
Now, Brahms did say, you know, I'm not going to include John 3.16, and f for a lot of us that is the one verse summary of Christianity, and so uh, that's also been sort of a negative <laughs> um, a way to view this, uh, that Brahms didn't want to write a, a piece about Christ. But this verse is actually very similar to John 3.16, and Luther's description of this verse sounds very much like John 3.16. Um, so at least four clear references to Jesus that are sprinkled throughout from the beginning to the end. And, you know, well, a lot of these authors will say, well, it's not about Jesus, but they will, they will never say who it really is about. You know, they don't have an alternative reading. They just say, no, it's not that. But, like, it has to be something. Uh, then I have divine epithets. That's... It's not a word you hear every day, and proper names. So here are several references uh, to God. The first one is, uh, Thou hast created all things. So this is God as creator. So it's, this is a hymn that, uh, from Revelation, it's in the next to last movement. So it's right after the resurrection is depicted. So it's really, it's a heavenly scene of worship. And they're referring to God as creator. Well, now, you know the whole world does not believe that God created the earth. I hope you know that today. And there are lots of religions that don't think the world was created, or they have different traditions about how it was created. There are at least seven different, totally different cosmogonic myths. There's a phrase I learned, cosmogonic myths, how the world was created. So that narrows it down right there, okay. Uh, if you don't believe God created the world, I don't think this piece is for you. You know, this is not a universal piece. That rules out a lot of people. Uh, number four from Psalm 84 refers to the living God. That's a phrase that the Hebrews use. It shows up, I think, around 30 times in the Old and New Testament. And usually at key, very key times when David is facing Goliath, he refers to the living God. Uh, when Daniel's in the lion's den, uh, it's used then, and then when Jesus asked Peter, who do you think I am? He says, you're the son of the living God. Okay, so this is distinguishing God from idols, lifeless idols, and Baal, who was a fertility God, they sort of believed they sort of died and were born again according to, you know, agricultural seasons. Then Lord of hosts. Now, uh, in the Hebrew and the German, that's a little more distinctive. So, Zebaot, Luther didn't try to translate that. He just did a transliteration from the Hebrew. So, Zebaot is, that is a proper name that's used for God, I mean, hundreds of times in the Old Testament. Uh, so, if your God is not Zebaot, then this piece also is not for you. And people knew that term. And of course, Lord of Hosts shows up in Isaiah 6.3. That's part of the Mass. And in Latin, you know, es sabaot. They didn't, they didn't try to translate that either. And then a mighty fortress, Luther himself says, uh, uh, who, who is this uh, Jesus? Oh, he's the Lord of Sabaot. Hello. Uh, so if if you see the word Zabaot, then this is about the Old Testament God. And that would leave out a lot of religions. And, uh, of course, almost any sacred text, you will see the word Zabaot. Um, of course, then it's um, part of the Sanctus. And in German, uh, uh, Luther translated that into German, so that we have the uh, the German Heilig, Zebaot shows up there. It's in Elijah and Messiah and all sorts of German texts. Then the other proper name is Zion. So uh, the redeemed Lord shall return to Zion. Okay, well that leaves out a lot of people too. You know, you mentioned Zion to certain religions. They they want to go blow it up. They don't. They're not looking forward to going to Zion. They want to destroy it. Uh, so these are very specific names, and, and most of the people don't even refer to this because they know that would take them a different direction. So but Zebaot has to mean something, Zion, and you can't argue, well, you know, we don't know what that means today. 
And one of my arguments is, well, that's what musicologists do. We help you understand what these texts meant at some point. So we will explain it to you. And then um, some many of the people you know, talk about being universal. So I compare it the, some of the doctrinal ideas to other religions. And there are certain places where Christianity might intersect with another religion. But generally, there are lots of differences. And there's some key things here that are very specific to Christianity. So I talk about redemption, righteousness, uh, and I said, well, you know, sin's not mentioned, there's not about judgment, but, you know, you can't talk about righteousness unless you've talked about sin or forgiveness of sin. Uh, victory over death and uh, resurrection. So, you know, the physical, physical resurrection of the body, is that is not a universal belief. But some of these writers will talk about, oh, yeah, the universal desire for resurrection. It's like, I'm sorry. That's not, you don't know anything about world religions. And I think people who haven't studied religion just, and they've grown up in the Judeo-Christian belief system, whether they believe it or not, that's sort of part of our culture, and they don't realize how different some religions are, so I set them straight on that. And this reference to dear brothers is like, it says, he's not writing this to everybody. It's like, you know, the people in our faith community, the people that believe, uh, this is who I'm talking to. Next page, there's quite a bit on heaven here and Psalm 84. And he talks about longing for the courts of the Lord, which when it's originally written, it, it did mean the temple, but as Christians, we interpret it to mean heaven. And then uh, we already talked a little bit about that hymn in Revelation. So there's, uh, you know, people praising God for eternity. You know, that is a different view of the afterlife than a lot of religions have. Some of it, you know, Islam is much more about physical, com physical comfort. There's a little bit spiritual uh, element to it, but it's more about physical comfort. There are some religions where you basically dissolve into nothingness or to some, you know, spiritual being or some kind of unity. But this is, you know, active worship by people in resurrected bodies to the creator of the world. Okay, that's really only Christianity. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on comfort and joy in the piece. Uh, most people talk about the comfort, but they don't really talk about the joy. And uh, I bring in the stages of death and grief, and you may know about these, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And this is, has been around for a number of decades now. Some people believe it, some people don't. It's supposed to be really just a general guideline. People don't necessarily go through all of them. You don't necessarily go in order. You might kind of go back and forth between them. But these are sort of common responses to grief. Sometimes, whether it's, you know, you're facing your own death or facing someone else's death. You deny, oh, this can't be true, this is not really happening, then you get mad, this isn't fair, why me? Then you say, oh, God, if you will, you know, heal me, then I'll do this. You bargain, then you get depressed, and finally, hopefully, you will accept it. And acceptance is not a bad place to be, but, you know, the Bible promises more than just acceptance. Uh, and I, you know, and there are places where Brahms could have drawn on at least some of this anger and depression. There's some of that in the Bible, and a lot of people say, "Well, you know, it's a heathen text." That Brahms says, "I couldn't find a heathen enough text in the Bible." It's like, well, because there's, there's, it's probably not there. You know, the Bible is truthful that it, it, it shows people being weak, and people lose their temper and they get mad at God, they get depressed. That's just being human and the Bible shows us that. Now Brahms did uh, set several texts that I think deal with acceptance. It's like we all die, God help me to know I'm going to die, help me to embrace that fact. Uh, number six, you know, earth is not our home. We need to be focused on heaven. Uh, then I have some verses there that relate to comfort and joy and so joy is is way beyond acceptance. Um, so I, I probably, you can read those, you, you get that. Uh, just a few kind of interesting illustrations here. Here's a famous representation of 
the scene from Revelation that Brahms quotes, and this is where the 24 elders cast their crowns before the throne, and then the verse that Brahms sets is what they're, they're singing. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, so that's by a famous German artist, Albert Durer. And then a lot of people will say, oh, this comfort uh, is, is not divine comfort, it's human comfort. And I just want to go, where, where do you get that? There's nothing in here about people doing anything to help you. You know, uh, Jesus says, you, uh, you will be comforted, so, or they will be comforted. It's a passive voice. Some people call it the divine passive. You don't need to say, God will comfort you. You'll say, you'll be comforted. So it was sort of a way to avoid using God's name, God's holy name. And one writer said that Jesus spoke in a divine passive all the time. So here's uh, just an illustration on page 10. That here's a setting of, a depiction of Matthew 5, 4, uh, they will be comforted. It shows you know, an angel there comforting someone grieving. So if you look at all the Beatitudes, almost all the promises, only God can fulfill those promises. People can't give you any of those promises in the Beatitudes. Okay, at page 11, uh, I looked some at the early performances, and this was not part of my original plan because at first I thought, you know what, I don't really care what people thought back then. I just, what does it, what should I think now? What should we think now? And I thought, I'm sorry if they didn't understand it back then, but I can, I've had more time to look at it, and uh, I'm a scholar, and uh, you know, I can just, I can make my own decisions. But when it was going to become a book, I thought, well, maybe I should look at early performances. Uh, so, and there have been some lists out there, but I've found, I've tried harder than anyone else has, and I've found 200. That's a lot. That's a lot of performances of a pretty difficult piece. And the first performance we know was on a Good Friday, and that's why the conductor who led it said, well, the only day I, I, can, I can perform this piece for you, but the only day we have open on the calendar is Good Friday. And, of course, Good Friday was the most important musical day for Lutherans, and, you know, the St. Matthew Passion was written for Good Friday. It's a nice three-hour piece. And so that's why the guy says, could you make it a little bit more appropriate for Good Friday? You know, could you throw the cross in there, please? And that's when Brahms says no. Um, but, you know, that, that same conductor did it several more times on Good Friday in his church. And it's like, you know, okay, I, if you didn't want to do it the first time, I understand it, but don't keep doing it on Good Friday if you don't think it's good enough. And Brahms himself conducted four performances on Good Friday. So a lot of performances during Holy Week, I mean, Back then, Holy Week was very important, and the Lutherans really did that up musically very well. So not only 60 performances during Holy Week, more than 30 on Good Friday, but the third most often performed work on Good Friday. And I would say it's not really a Good Friday piece. It's not, was it meant to be performed on Good Friday? It doesn't deal specifically with the narrative of the cross. It's not inappropriate for Good Friday because it is the result of Jesus' sacrifice. We can look forward to heaven and we can be comforted in our mourning. But certainly at the time, people thought it was appropriate. A couple other uh, particular feast days uh, in Lutheran tradition, Totenfest. So if you know, you know, we just had All Saints Day the other day, uh, and of course, the reason Reformation Day is October 31st is because Wittenberg was one of the big sites for pilgrimages. They had thousands of relics there. If you went to visit all the relics, you'd get out of purgatory faster. So he knew people were going to be in town, and this is what was going on, and this would be a good time. He was savvy uh, with PR. Um, so. Uh, the Lutherans didn't want to have that All Saints Day because that was when they were praying for the dead. So they came up with something called Totenfest or Toten Zontag. Uh, and that was just a time of remembrance. So a lot of biblical texts were performed and it became sort of another day to perform large sacred pieces. And frequently they would perform 
a traditional requiem, but you know, as musicians, we let certain texts float back and forth and we forgive them certain things. But it was frequently performed on his Totenfest and one author has suggested that's probably what Brahms had in mind when he wrote it. One of the few people that I would agree with. And then there was this Bustag. It was sort of like uh, a national day of prayer that they, it was very common in Germany and they had actually so every little German country nationality had their own little boost talk, but it was performed occasionally for there. Uh, okay, now just to hurry through this, what I will say that I've also looked at the music itself, and Brahms was famous for being a scholar of early music. He studied it and he incorporated it very much into his own style. Now he didn't just borrow things, but he really made it his own. And there are lots of references and allusions to earlier pieces in a lot of his music, but there's quite a bit uh, in this piece. And there are several things here linked to Messiah where he's using uh, sort of similar text. So, of course, the opening of Messiah, those first several movements, very famous because it all comes from Isaiah 40, which is really famous for its emphasis on comfort, one of the main themes of the Requiem. And Brahms sets... It's a New Testament quotation of Isaiah, but he's sort of inserting a couple verses from Isaiah that have been left out of Messiah. So I kind of think he knew enough to look at Isaiah if he's looking for passages about comfort. And he says, well, you know, I can't really set some of these things already set by Handel, so I'll, I'll do this one. Um, then a whole section from 1 Corinthians 15, if you know that chapter, is all about the resurrection. That Paul's explaining, you know, not only Jesus' resurrection, but how that's, that's the foundation for our hope in resurrection. So a very long sequence of verses from that one chapter that Handel sets and Brahms sets almost all of those. And, ha and Messiah was very well known uh, in Germany at this time, so... You know, you start hearing verses you've heard from Messiah, and maybe you didn't, you don't know anything about Isaiah, but I've heard that over here, or I don't know anything about First, Cor First Corinthians, but I've heard that text before, and it's from Messiah. So, how can you not think about Jesus? And then uh, the text from Revelation, very similar to the closing text uh, from Messiah as well. One of these hymns of praise in Revelation, and there are like seven different scenes of worship in Revelation they draw from. Uh, then a number of other pieces that he quotes from Bach B. Meyer Mass, St. Matthew Passion, Beethoven, Misa Solemnis, Handel Messiah, Vincent Elijah, and Schutz, Saul, Saul. So these are some of the greatest pieces ever written in the sacred music tradition, some of the greatest pieces ever written about Jesus. Uh, so you're alluding to the St. Matthew Passion, but I'm not supposed to think about Jesus? I'm sorry, this is too complicated for me. And, and, and people say, you know, Brahms expected people to recognize these illusions, or at least some of the people, not everyone would, but they weren't supposed to be totally hidden. And I say, are we, are we are at a disadvantage if we understand these things? You know, no, he's, he's given them as clues. Uh, then a couple of musical examples. Uh, there are 13. I've got uh, the opening of this fugue, the Revelation hymn. And then at the bottom, I have the Bach B minor mass. It's, so Bach himself is combining the old style of music with his Baroque style. So it's almost, and he's quoting a Gregorian, Gregorian chant as the fugue subject. So it's almost like a little history uh, of music history here and then Brahms is quoting Bach quoting older styles so Brahms is sort of like the whole history of sacred music right here um, and I'm sorry that looks a lot alike I mean the notes aren't necessarily the same but long few subject very steady accompaniment very similar then uh, the next page he quotes uh, this opening verse of Luther's Vater Unser in Himmelreich, which is our Father in Heaven. So, so Luther did um, a chorale version of the Lord's Prayer, and basically he took each verse, each phrase of the prayer, and then sort of explained it. 
in this chorale. So it's like a little catechism. And so, you know, I'm sure all the German public school students would have learned that. So uh, he quotes that in this um, third movement for the baritone, which has a very different flavor, as it has a sort of a modal flavor to it that the rest of Brahms does not. And then uh, if you look at the little circled places, you'll see at the cadence, the, the baritone is singing a D while there's a C sharp in the bass. That is a, a Baroque type of cadence where you have that clash, leading tone and tonic at the same time. And uh, I am confident he got it from uh, the Schutz piece, Saul, Zal, Zal, Why You Persecute Me, <clears throat> which uh, by Schutz, it was published in the 1830s. We know Brahms performed it himself you know, a number of years before he wrote the Requiem and he studied it. It's in the same key as his piece. Uh, the Brahms starts with uh, an address to Lord, Herr, and just like the shoots is addressed to Saul. So you, uh, you address the person and then you pause. And there's another chord that's very similar, but that C sharp to D, and I can't tell you how many times I played through this on the piano, I got, there is something here, this sounds so different. I just, I don't know what it, where he got this. Then all of a sudden I actually played all the notes. <laughs> and heard the D and the C sharp at the same time. I thought, well, it's shoots, of course. Uh, so after all this, 15, here's the actual text. So I would encourage you to read this and see what you think. You know, you don't have to believe me, uh, but make your own decision here. And this, uh, basically my translation from Luther's German, so it might be a little different from the English translations you know. Then the last page is basically how I would explain the text. Based on everything I've learned, everything I know about the Bible, this is how I understand the text and how I would explain it to someone. So a very opening answer. Jesus himself promised. I know that was Jesus talking, and I'm going to uh, acknowledge that. So... Uh, read that. Uh, if you have any thoughts, especially how this could be, this last page could be better, I would appreciate that because this is, this is going to be the last thing in the book. And it's very personal. And I don't know, it's like sort of crossing a line in scholarship, but you know, I'm going to do it. So pray for me that I can finish this book this December before I come back to teach and do things. And if, if you want to stay for questions, um, I have no place to go because I'm, <laughs> I'm on sabbatic. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, you will have to speak into the microphone if you have to. Want okay, to well, thank question. you very much. Yes. And so does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? I know some of you may be rushed for time, but we'll take some time here. Hey, I'm Deanie. I'm a MDiv student, and mm -hmm. um, I'm taking systematic theology this semester. And Dr. Bingham was talking about um, how we got the Bible over time and how it started with oral tradition and Bible times. And he spoke about music recently and about oh. how um, how a lot of times the the audience is listening to the scripture being read because no one had a copy of the Bible, mm -hmm. and then they would sing those verses in song to help with memory. And mm -hmm. so does this, does the classical music, um, classical text of the music, does that kind of fit into that same tradition, do you think? Well, not by this time, not by Brahms's time, but certainly I'd say that's probably first thousand years or more, you know, by, I mean, part of the Reformation, you're really getting scripture into the hands of the people for the first time in their own language. And of course, printing, with the development of printing, it makes it possible, makes it cheaper. Uh, so I think it wasn't so much um, um, sort of a learning device by this time. Uh, but certainly a lot of the chorales, I would say, were written to teach doctrine. Yeah, and that, that's things they would have sung in church and, you know, a lot of it based on scripture. 
Anyone else? All right, well, let's give Dr. Lott another round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming. And thank you for coming.